Holy Spirit. Amen. Christ is ascended. In the Traparion for the Ascension, we sing, You ascended in glory, O Christ our God, granting joy to your disciples by the promise of the Holy Spirit. Through the blessing, they were assured that you are the Son of God, the Redeemer of the world. Christ promised that after his ascension, he would give the Holy Spirit, who would guide the believers into all the truth. And this is written in John 16, verse 13. And today we see one of the major examples of the work of the Holy Spirit in the church as we commemorate the first ecumenical council, the first major gathering of church leaders from all of Christendom to work out doctrinal problems. This morning we'll look at this event and also what can be understood about the Holy Spirit in the church today and how we find in him unity in community. The first ecumenical council took place from May the 20th to August the 25th in the year 325, and it dealt with the heresy of Arianism. Arius was a priest of Alexandria who expounded his doctrines from around the year 315, that Christ was not eternal, and therefore was not really God in the same way as God the Father. The historian Sophie Columzin points out that Arius was a dignified and an intelligent man who had tried to make of Christianity a religion that would make sense to the pagan deistic philosophies in the area. He was also a clever propagandist and he cultivated his popularity well with speeches and letters and even wrote popular songs in which he formulated his theological arguments. He wanted to safeguard the transcendence of God the Father and this made sense to many people. His idea of a supreme divine being separate from Jesus, was easier to accept to some than the belief that God could be fully human and fully divine, who incarnated and died for us. The Bishop of Alexandria, uh, Bishop Alexander, who's a saint, who in fact was commemorated last Friday, attempted to correct him and persuade him. And eventually, when this didn't work, Arius was deposed in a local council in Alexandria in the, in the year 321. However, he continued to spread his teachings, so much so that the Emperor Constantine convened the council to meet in Nicaea. And Constantine said that disputes of this kind were more dangerous than war and other conflicts. They bring me more grief than anything else, he said. So 318 bishops were present, including St. Nicholas of Myra, St. Spiridon of Trimethus, and St. Athanasius, who's seen as the hero of the occasion. They were joined by many bishops who had been maimed and mutilated as a result of the Roman persecutions. Sophie Columzin uh, points out that Christianity with Arianism was under more peril than even under the Roman persecution. The church's position was precarious. We have the benefit of hindsight and we know how things end. But at the time, there were various different deviations from the truth, and the hierarchs of the church had to gather to make clear the fundamental tenet of the gospel, that we can be saved, that we can have communion with God. And this can only happen if Christ is God. If not, then his work on the cross and his part in the divine economy is not really salvific. So they declared that he was of one essence with the Father, the term homoousios is ascribed to St. Athanasius. And the first seven articles of the Creed were ratified, those concerning the Father and the Son. The details of the Holy Spirit were added in a later council, hence the correct term for the Creed is the Nicaea Constantinopolitan Creed. So we commemorate the Church Fathers for the part they played in upholding orthodoxy, in keeping the door open for us to have connection with God. And we remind ourselves that in our church, any doctrine or any dogma exists always for this reason, to make possible our salvation. Now, sadly, Arianism didn't just disappear. St. Athanasius himself was persecuted by Arian factions and exiled no less than five times from Alexandria as different rulers came and, and went and either favored or opposed Arianism according to what was convenient for them. Many other heretical ideas developed too that had to be dealt with in the remaining ecumenical councils. However, as Christ prayed, the Holy Spirit guided them through them all. And the Holy Spirit still guides us today. 
like in the 300s, we still have big problems now. We still have tragic situations. The patriarchates of Antioch and Jerusalem are temporarily out of communion over territory disputes in the Middle East. The ecumenical patriarchate together with the patriarchate of Russia are likewise out of communion over the situation in Ukraine. However, we, th we see throughout history examples of these and how they all get sorted out. And they get sorted out in the community of the church. Just like we see in the ecumenical councils, the Holy Spirit guides the community of the church as it comes together to face its challenges. We see that in the church, individualism has no place. We see the pattern of the communal agreement being necessary right from the very beginning, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on all the believers together on the day of Pentecost as they prayed with one heart and one mind. The Council of Jerusalem, which is recorded in Acts chapter 15, is the model by which other later councils were based, and this united Gentiles and Jews as Christians. Actually, we could say that the foundation for making decisions and reaching unity and consensus in community occurred in the very act of the creation of humans. In Genesis 1.26, we read, let us make man in our image, the Trinity says. And this is the persons of the Holy Trinity agreeing among themselves. So the spark for our creation was as a result of the Trinity in council, as it were. Since we're created in the image of a community of persons, there is an existential aspect here too. Father Andrew Stephen Damick points out that we are a family of churches, and like any other family, we can't just ignore each other. Other Christian denominations can continue as if there was no one else in the whole of Christendom. They don't have to work their issues out. But we, as the body of Christ, have to move towards full communion and sort out our issues. And for this, our hierarchs need our prayers. Since truth is found in community, there is a danger when we attach ourselves to one particular leader or to the writings of one particular saint or to one era in church history or worse to the writings of one person who isn't a saint making this person the filter and the ultimate arbiter of all we believe is dangerous this is characteristic of the great heresies this is characteristic of a cult this is not characteristic of the one holy, catholic, and apostolic church. The same principle applies today in our families and in our parish community. Christ prays, Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. Isn't this what we want in our marriages? Isn't this what we want in our families? Isn't this what we want in our parish? Every parish is a microcosm of the church at large, and this is one of the implications of us being Catholic, as we say in the Creed. Every family, too, is a mini church. The Holy Spirit moves in our parishes and in our families, leading us towards unity and harmony. And like the church fathers of the great councils, we can either cooperate in this movement or we can get in the way of it. And the way that we get in the way of it is through pride. We see that pride is the root of all heresy, and the same spirit can manifest in us too, where we don't want to be told what to do, we want our own way. Let's not forget that though he may have been a good man, Arius refused to listen to the Bishop Alexander who had attempted to correct him. He refused to listen to the voices of the bishops who assembled in the local council of Alexandria. He refused to submit to the voice of the community. Now, I know what you Star Wars fans are thinking out there. This is just like the Jedi Knights who meet together in their Jedi councils to sort out the problems of the galaxy. But their rulings were not accepted by Anakin Skywalker. Now, he wasn't a bad guy. He just didn't want to do what the other Jedis thought was a good idea. And he goes on to become the evil Darth Vader for those who are not aware of Star Wars. We all have someone to submit to. Children must obey their parents. 
Spouses must submit to each other. We all have to submit to the church, or to what Father Jeff says, or to what His Eminence might say. How good are we at submitting to the wishes and the wills of those people around us? This is especially pronounced in this time of lockdown. Our church leaders have had to make very difficult decisions about what to do in a global pandemic. But the same Holy Spirit that guided the fathers of the first ecumenical council guides our leaders even now. And this has been a chance for progress towards unity or towards divisiveness. There have been many beautiful moments, people accepting with grace and good humor the situation and making the most of praying from home, people reaching out to each other with love, people joining new groups and making new connections. People live streaming the services of different churches. People joining in with the call to prayer from the monks of Mount Athos at 10 o'clock every night. In our Foundations for Orthodox Christianity group, there have even been people who've been able to access this online from interstate and outback Victoria. However, sadly, and especially in the online world, we see many people within the church at large who have nothing better to do and to point out how they are more correct than the priests, than the bishops, and entire churches. And if not in this issue, then in many others. These people follow in the same footsteps as the heretics of old, refusing to accept with humility what is being decided by their hierarchs, the very people Christ prayed for as those in apostolic continuity from the 12 disciples. We're not talking here about debates over foundational issues now. You won't get Orthodox people saying, well, Christ isn't God, or there is no Trinity. But the attitude is no less damaging to themselves and to others. In the Patristics study group, which meets on a Monday night, we've been studying the writings of St. Dorotheus of Gaza. And we looked at a writing of his on humility. And in this writing, he points out two types of pride. The first, he says, is when we despise others, thinking that we're better than them or more correct. And this leads to the second type, where we lift ourselves up even against God. And he tells the story of a man who, if anyone told anything to him to correct him, he said, well, who's he? He's not one of Zosimus or his lot. And then he began to cheapen even them, saying, there is no one of any importance but Saint Macarius. After a little while, he began to say, well, who is Macarius anyway? There is no one good except perhaps Saint Basil or Gregory. In a short while, he began to even debunk them, saying, Who is Basil? Who is Gregory? There is no one who counts but Peter and Paul. At this point, Saint Dorotheus confronts him, saying, Really, brother, you're going to end up despising them too. And sure enough, he began, Who is Peter? Who is Paul? There is no one but the Holy Trinity. And so at last, he lifted himself up even against God. And there we are told he gave up. So pride can manifest in different ways. Pride in looking with disdain at how other parishioners practice their faith, convinced that we are more correct than they. Pride in people leaving churches to go to others where they can be really orthodox. Pride in criticizing the bishops for closing churches or for other decisions that they may have made. Pride in criticizing church leaders for how they apply the canons or disciplinary laws of the church in a pastoral sense. Or pride in deciding that some aspects of church life are just not for us. Let's not forget that the word heresy comes from the Greek word to choose. So to, to, to be selective about what we believe is the definition of being a heretic. And we must be on our guard. So to conclude, we commemorate the fathers of the First Ecumenical Council for stepping up with courage and stepping up with faith. We can have confidence that the Holy Spirit that guided them still guides us and will guide the church to the end of time as was promised. The deposit of the truth and the guidance of the Holy Spirit manifests itself in the community of the church. Pride is the root of all heresy. And though we may not be heretical in our views, Maybe we have become prideful, self-willed, headstrong, critical. In this time of lockdown, 
May we be people who in our thoughts, words, and actions build up the community of the church, build up the community of our family, build up the community of our parish in humility and in love. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Unconquerable trophy of the truth.